what up? It's your boy, the Destiny Legend, Leon Rogers, and welcome to the Three Ring Circus. We like to call later with Leon. That's right, man. 107.5 WGCI. You already know, right out of Chicago, Illinois, but right now, rocking on Fox So, and I got three heavy hitters in the game on with me tonight. I am so, so, so excited. First off, let me go with the brother that's known for talking about your mama and has been doing comedy since Jesus was around. George Wallace, what's up, G? Oh, G, what's happening? <laughs> oh. oh, he's on mute. He's on mute. That's all right. We got you. We got you. All right, let's go next. My homegirl straight from the UK across the pond, across the water, but she's now living in LA. Gina Yashare. Hello, what's, Gina. What's happening? How you doing, Leon? But it's good. It's very good to be here. Very good. <laughs> and last but not least, man. One of my idols, man, somebody who I like to try to pattern my style against being versatile and being able to do a lot of things. The one and only Mr. Wayne Brady. Does he have to pop a cap at somebody tonight? What's up, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, sir? Who has me on mute? Doing, What's brother? going on here? <laughs> let me try to come in another way. Can I go? Uh, let me try to stick we, with you guys. We, we can hear you. Know, you, you, know, you, know, you, know, you George. You, know. you just got... messed up Wayne's introduction, George. Typical. <laughs> wait, wait. George oh, is man. 97 years old. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody is allowed to mess up my intro, that's the <laughs> How you feeling, sir? How you feeling, Dwayne? You all oh, right? I'm good, man. Yeah. I am good. I cannot complain about a damn thing. We're going to make sure uh, uh, George is all right. George, you all right, brother? Okay. He, now, we heard you before. No, he's now gone. He's gone. We'll be right... We, we don't get back to you though. So listen, a lot of Gemini's, a lot of Gemini's. It's Gemini season. So before we get started, I want to kick off uh, the show by showing some love to celebrities who are bringing in their birthdays this week. Kanye West, born day is on June 8th. My man, comedian Lil Duval, he's celebrating his birthday on June 12th. And Prince would have been 62 years old today, man. The legend, to me, the greatest entertainer of all time. I'm sorry, all you Michael Jackson fans. Y'all gonna get mad. But Prince is the man. And we got to give a special happy belated birthday to my man, Wayne Brady, who celebrated his birthday on June 2nd. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you, sir. Happy now, birthday. I would be remiss <laughs> if I didn't add one more celebrity to that list. I live with her. It's my beautiful wife, Nicole Rogers. Uh, she celebrated her 43rd birthday today. And it's very special because her brother, who was five years older than her, shared the birthday on the same day. We lost him three to four years ago. So they were birthday twins. So happy birthday to my beautiful wife, Nicole. And Danny Man, big boy up top, happy birthday to you too. Now let's get into the show. George, you with us? No. All right, all right. We're going we to keep it moving. Where's George? George, come on, man. I hope everybody's feeling all right. Um, Gina. Yes. I want to come to you first. Um, the success of your CBS show, uh, yeah. Bob Hart's Abishola, yeah. where you also happen to be the co-executive producer. Uh, how did your show come about and, and what made you come up with this idea that's been rocking on CBS? Well, long story short, uh, I've been pitching shows with my Nigerian family for a long time. Nobody wanted it. Nobody. I was pitching and getting turned down left, right and center. This show came from Chuck Lorre of Big Bang Theory, Two and a Half Men, Kaminsky Method. You know the guy. I got a call out of the blue uh, from my agent saying Chuck Lorre wants to meet you. I was living in New York at the time. They flew me out for a meeting. Chuck was like, I want to make this show with Billy Gardell. I don't want to make another Michael Molly. I want a Nigerian woman. Uh, but we're three white guys. We don't know how to write these th this thing. So we need you to come in as a consultant. And I'm like, what, a consultant on all things African? This sounds suspect. Obviously, I didn't see it say that in the room because I'm not an idiot. It was all in my head. So <laughs> I called my agent after the meeting. I was like, nah, this doesn't sound good. I'm not into it, not into it. But luckily I've got people who will scream at me when I'm, when I'm about to make a huge mistake. And that's my brother, my best friend in England. So they were like, it's an opportunity, give it a go. So I stayed, I sat in a room with Chuck and the guys and you know, I started to think, oh, you know what? This might be not be exploitative. Like I thought, I think this might be a good thing. So I stayed and helped them write the pilot. And within a couple of days, they were like, well, yeah, you're no longer a consultant, you're a co-creator, you're a producer. Yeah. And obviously, as a comedian, my dream has always been to be the best friend on someone else's sitcom, just come in, steal the scene, 
bounce and then use that to sell <laughs> comedy clubs. And so I wrote myself oh, in on. as her best friend. And that's how I got in on the show. So yeah, I'm getting all the checks, Leon, is what I'm saying. All Yo, the checks. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Now, were you surprised about how quickly people gravitated to the show, especially because it's also about an interracial relationship. You know, are you, were you surprised that people grabbed onto it so quick? Yeah, because I was, you know, I was hoping that people would just give it a chance. Because obviously people were like, ah, oh, it's a big fat white guy, it's a Nigerian woman, it's going to be exploitative, it's going to be this white savior stuff. But when I came on the show, I made it clear uh, to the Chuck and the guys, I was like, listen, uh, if I'm going to come on board with this, this, this is going to be authentic. It's got to be authentic. And it's not going to be a white savior thing. She has to have her own thing going on. She has to have her own money. This guy is going to have to work to earn her love and not the other way around. It's not mm. going to be that. So I was hoping, you know, people were a little bit suspicious when it first came out, which is understandable because they didn't know I was involved behind the scenes. They just looked at Chuck Lorre and think, oh, it's a white guy making a show with a half Nigerian cast. It's going to be suspect. But uh, I made sure that every step of the way, if I said, if this doesn't work, this isn't right, we wouldn't say this, we wouldn't do this i want nigerians to watch this and go oh this is us this is proud i'm proud of this i can watch this so yeah people were suspicious at first but you know once they started watching it and realized what we were doing and they could see that this isn't going to be an embarrassment to black people that the cast is 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 well it's well cast and it's well written and it's not it's all three-dimensional characters people really got on board and look let's be honest cbs is a very white middle-aged absolutely network so I didn't know what to expect. I it was like, people are either going to like it or hate it. But, you know, these people are falling in love with the characters because it, it's showing the immigrant people are just people. We're just here working. We're not coming to take. We're coming to contribute. And uh, so people in middle America who may never have met someone like me or someone like these Nigerians will go, oh, they're just like it does. They love like us. They work like us. They just want to do the best for their families and kids. And, you know, in the time that we were living in, the four years of uh, skullduggery, I'll say, skullduggery that was happening in this country, this show couldn't have come at a better time. Absolutely. Wayne, let's talk to you, man. You've done a lot in your career, switching gears up. Um, you worked on some amazing projects. How did you get your start in the comedy game? Well, before I talk about myself, I've got to give Gina a, a, a big big round of applause. I mean, because I, mean, I love the show Thank first, you, first off. And, and, uh, and, and I've been a friend of Billy's since we were in high school together back back in Orlando. Oh, wow. Oh. I didn't you know, know you went to school. I love Billy. That's my bro right there. Well, yeah, <laughs> since, yeah. But, but what I'm really proud of is in listening to you, the fact that, that this, the, the the problem that I see right now, still in this place where where we are in this day and age, is what's beautiful is that CBS, which is also my home network, is telling this story uh, of a Nigerian family, and my folks are from the U.S. Virgin Islands, so so I have an immigrant history as well, and so Thanks so knowing knowing how our culture differs from the main mainstream, the fact that it's on CBS, I applaud it, and I think it's amazing. But as I listen to you, I go, hmm, the fact that Gina kicked that idea around for so many years. And nobody and wanted it. <laughs> and, and your entry point had to be with someone else bringing you in. I sit back and I listen and I'm like, wow, we come so far yet we have so much farther to go. But mm -hmm. I am thankful for you that the story is being told. But I would love it if we could walk in the story and go, this is what this thing is. So that's just my side side note. I'm so proud of you. Thank so, you. Thank um, you, Wayne. Yeah. I'm a big fan of yours, Wayne. Big Wayne. fan. Wayne, <laughs> Wayne, two things before we get into the question I asked you. One, yes, sir. I didn't know you your people were from the Virgin Islands. That explains the always moisturized looking skin. I was like, you <laughs> ain't no American, brother. Got to have my see me and George, you can tell we from the dirt out here. You know, we <laughs> yeah. got, got the naturally moisturized skin. Two, uh, uh, piggybacking on what you just said to Gina, do you think now with everything that's been going on in the world, though, it's time for artists of color to exploit that guilt feeling that they got and start bringing stuff to the table? Because I feel like right now they feel guilty and, and they're trying, you know, hey, let's let's give these guys this because we feel so terrible about all the BS that's going on. <laughs> 
I there mean, are so many stories that need need to be told that that like this is a window. Sad, sadly, it shouldn't be a window. It should right. be a whole damn barn door. But <laughs> if this is the window, then those are the stories that we need to start flooding it with. And I'm trying to produce a couple and I've got a bunch of friends out here and everybody's trying to make their move because they, there are stories that need to be heard. And this is the time, and I'm using this opportunity to bring as many people into Chuck World as, proper, as po possible. I've got actors working that would never have got a chance uh, mm. in Hollywood. I've got black people in the writer's room. You know, I, I, I brought Chuck and the guys to comedy clubs and just put my friends on. So I'd be headlining the show and I'd just put my friends on. And, and uh, if they liked any particular comedian, I'd go, oh, well, she writes. Would you like to meet her? And oh. that's how I got black writers in the writing room. So I'm trying to... I'm just trying to do my bit from this end, you know. I'm just trying to get us in there quickly before the door shuts. <laughs> hey, but Wayne, I'm gonna come back to you real quick. Well, George, let's talk about you've been around a long time, man. You're an OG in this game, triple OG, you know what I'm saying? Certified. So ha have you seen a change? I mean, like, what are some of the changes you have seen? Because you you coming back from doing comedy in the time where well, it was a lot of pressure on you guys, you know, Dick Gregory, the Dick Gregories of the world and people like that. And now you when you come to to now, have you seen change or like Wayne said, are we still kind of like spinning our wheels? We stuck in neutral. I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of good things happen and, and things will continue to change and be good at the same time, be bad. Of course, things have changed since we got HBO, which is another uh, uh, avenue for uh, especially black comedians uh, to uh, uh, to expand on their thoughts and, and be able to say what they want to say. So when you got away from the other networks, which was, which was wonderful, I started and Wayne started and uh, you you had three networks, ABC, CBS, and uh, NBC. So you couldn't express yourself, you couldn't curse, you had to do what you wanted to do. So I, I'm still clean, but I want to cuss. I want to cuss so badly. So. <laughs> I don't, Leon, let me tell you, I don't cuss because, but I found a guy in Atlanta named Waka Flocka Flame. So I think Waka Flocka ain't cussing, but it's close enough. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. talking to all you Waka Flockers, Wayne. <laughs> everybody's a Waka Flocka. I like, I was at church Sunday, my preacher walked up in the pulpit. I said, look at this Waka Flocka. Waka. So, Waka. so I have seen change and I've seen progress and I think we will continue to, to make progress and things are getting better for everybody. Look at her show, Gina, I saw her about two years ago. She said she was working on a show, and sure enough, it has come to fruition. Wayne, I met him back in 1962 when he was <laughs> Wayne. Wayne was teaching comedy. <laughs> Y'all think I'm old? Listen, I've been doing it for quite a while. I'm the most blessed person in the world, and you guys need to know this. And I love what I do. And you know, I thank God every day. I choke up because all I do is lie. I just make up stuff. Now, I read the list where I couldn't say the S word. I just make up stuff. Yeah. So just, I, I just love what I do. So I've seen a lot of change and I expect more changes coming. And there's, um, like you say, that people, uh, those people see what's happening in the world. They need us. We need them. Let's put it together and it's going to work out for everybody. I'm doing a new show that's crazy myself. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. That's yeah. changing the world also. Let's go pay some bills. When we come back, I got more with the heavy hitters. Gina Yashare, Wayne Brady, and my man, George Wallace. We'll be right back. More Lady with Leon. Stay tuned, you Waka Flockers. Yeah. Welcome back to Lady with Leon, man. The, uh, <laughs> the heavy hitter showstopper show, man. What a great way to go into hiatus with some of the best in the game, man. Gina Yashare, my man, Wayne yeah. Brady, George Wallace. I just want to say this, though, before we continue on any further. I've had a lot of guests on this show. But nobody, and I mean nobody, has stunned it with a baby grand piano in back of it. <laughs> all I, I, I just want to put that out there. Because okay. at first, I want, I want everybody to see he was outside at first. He said, man, let me quit playing with these people. Go ahead and about this baby grand real quick. <laughs> Gold, no less. Look at the trim. <laughs> Wayne. Look at the trim. Right. <laughs> Wayne. You, uh, uh, so you, you're a Florida, Florida guy. How, how did you get started in comedy? I was hearing you. Did you go to the University of Miami? No, but that's on my way. Hell no. Guys. He went to, you know, he went to DeVry. Why you ask a stupid question like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, brother, if, if, if DeVry can get you on the TV show that I've been on, then y'all need to sign up. <laughs> oh, no, no, he's smart. Huh? He's smart. Uh, can I say smart ass? He, he just crossed the line, didn't it? <laughs> so, so how did you, no, how I go to yeah, like I never went went there, but it's on my Wikipedia, and I get a newsletter from the University of Miami saying, "Hey, hey good alum. job, alum." I was like, "Well, 
I give me an honorary doctorate and go right. with it. Right. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm from Orlando, Florida. Um, the comedy route really, comedy just happened to happen. I'm, I started off acting at 16. My aim was always to go to Broadway. And I started off as a musical theater performer, um, playing, doing shows all, all around the US in different theaters, regional stuff, on tour and bands. And then I joined an improv company um, that I learned the art of improv, which was what I was doing anyway. Like George said, you know, we, we just make stuff up and nobody uh, has, has, has really <laughs> cultivated that art of making something uh -huh. out of nothing like black people, you know, so we had to do it with food and, <laughs> and with art. Yes. So, so I learned improv and to write sketch. And so then I moved out here uh, with a group. We, we called ourselves the house full of honkies. And we did a show at uh Hey, at wait, 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 no, wait, hold on. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everybody stop right there. Yeah. I'm about to Google the house full of honkies. The house of what? The house full of honkies. <laughs> that is hilarious. We, we wanted to be a name that folks went, what the hell? Yeah. And then they came, came in and they saw. And so that's how I got Who's Line. And so before that, you know, I was out. I was doing a bunch of uh, the theater and a lot of TV appearances, just doing straight roles mm -hmm. and whose line changed, changed everything up. So that really was my entree into comedy as it were. And then, you know, everything else went, went from there. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, the world is opening back up uh, next week. I mean, for some people it never closed, but the world is opening back up. Uh, are you ready to get back into the world, or, do you, or what has it been like for you during the COVID season? Or are you ready to get back out there and chomping at the pit? I'll start with ladies first. Yeah. For me, uh, I've been working all through the pandemic. I mean, I always lived that pandemic life because I'm I'm very much OCD. I'm a germaphobe. So when I used to travel to different hotels, I'm bringing my own bed sheets. I'm bringing gloves. I'm bringing slippers for the shower. My feet don't touch the carpet in the hotel room. So I've always been living that life. People used to laugh at me when like, they get on the plane and they'd be walking past me and I'm wiping everything down and spraying the air vents. But now everybody's watching all my old videos to see how to do it. So I've been living that COVID life a long time, but I've worked all through the pandemic. Um, uh, the show we made 18 episodes of the show all through the pandemic right um i even wrote a book I, well, let me show you i wrote a book people uh by the book yeah my new memoir coming out so i, I got the book deal in 2018 and uh, i did nothing because i'm a mad uh, procrastinator but then covid hit and i was like well looks like i gotta write this book and i literally wrote this in the first seven months of the pandemic which and it comes out tomorrow people my memoir comes out Ooh. tomorrow so uh but yeah so that's what i was doing i'm, I'm glad to be out in the world uh, i'm in la so you know it's probably you know california is probably what the one of the most vaxxed states you know, I got my back yes. as soon as I can. So, you know, it feels like we're almost back in the world and I'm glad for it because I didn't, I wasn't here for those Zoom shows. I am not into it. I, I'm, I'm, I want live. I want to be in front of people. I want, I like to see people's faces. I want to hear, hear the laughter. I want to do that. So I, um, I'm glad that the world is opening up again. <laughs> yeah, the energy, the energy is different when you're just in front of a live crowd. Nothing yeah. beats that, that interaction with the people. Wayne, what about you? All through the pandemic, you know, I was lucky uh, that I shot, I think here in my house and, and at a couple other places, I shot, you know, three national commercials. I, I, I wrote and directed them. And then I did a uh, spot for, for the BET Awards that, that we, we shot mm -hmm. here, this uh, tribute to, to Little Richard. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we started doing Let's Make a Deal at Home, where we just started doing it via, via Zoom and the network saw that that it was working. So we ended up doing Let's Make a Deal in the studio, doing a very COVID com compliant thing. And to Gina's point, to, to be in front of a live audience, that's, that's where the magic is. So doing everything over Zoom just wasn't happening. So I, I was very fortunate that we were able to start doing that show and a couple of the other shows I, I was taping. I, I haven't gotten a chance to do a live improv set yet and I'm itching. Next mm -hmm. week, I'm gonna be in Hawaii at the Blue Note Woo. Doing a mixture, doing a music, uh, doing a music concert slash doing an improv set, and I can't wait. It's the first time in a year and a half that I'll be in front of an audience just making stuff up, and it's beautiful. <laughs> George, George, what about you? You beat the blue bonnet plague, and you, you <laughs> man, I'm in, in Georgia. 
Georgia. I'm in Georgia. I beat you. I beat that, but I'm in Georgia. It's still here, man. I don't think the people in Georgia got the got the news. They, nobody. They still. I was I was driving down the street in Atlanta the other day, and there was a line outside, and the ladies were wearing their mask over their over their body parts, over their jewels, not on the yes. face, but down here, you know. So they didn't learn nothing yet. But I I've been having fun with Zoom. I did. Uh, uh, I'm just enjoying life. I did my first live audience last Monday with Jimmy Kimmel. And they had yeah. an audience of, of, of the, the people that worked there. I did a TV show with Phoebe Robinson called Everything is Trash. And we did an over, a COVID test every day. I've been rolling, but I stayed in the house for a year and a half. Didn't go nowhere. Didn't, nobody. I didn't let nobody in. I told this, this story all the time. I let J, uh, Jimmy Dean in, Sarah Lee, and, and, and Johnny Walker. That's all I let in my house. <laughs> nobody else. <laughs> no, listen to me. So, so I, I have been, I'm not going to do comedy again until September because uh, I need to wait and see what happens after this this big uh, everybody going out for the holidays and the summer. So I'm going to wait until September before I go out to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. George, what did you do before before you got your break in comedy? What were you doing? What was George Wallace doing? Well, you know, I wanted to do comedy since six years old. So I'm actually okay. living my dream and doing it. Man, if I die tomorrow, the world owes me nothing. I, I just, I wanted, I always wanted, I, uh, Red Fox, Red Skelton, uh, and uh, Mom's Mabley, uh, Richard Pryor. I just always enjoyed doing comedy, and I'm doing what I love to do. I wanted to work Las Vegas, and I went to Las Vegas, and I worked there longer than any African American. I've done more shows, and I didn't work for the hotels. I owned the shows in Las Vegas. I mm. owned the shows. I did the marketing. I did the advertising. I did the directing. Mm. Everything. Street walking, shaking hands. I ain't yeah. kissed no babies, but but I was out there. So I yeah. love what I do. Nobody has a job like me, Leon. Nobody. No. Yeah. And I gotta give you. A, I gotta give you a big shout out on that because you actually had uh, two very good friends of mine, mentors of mine, come out and open for you at the Flamingo. My man Tony Schofield. He got a chance to work with you guys. And Tony Schofield, always get somebody that's just awful. I like people to open, open for me that's just awful. He was the worst act. I, who else? Who's your next one? Who's the next, who's the next person you, you know that came Daniel up? Williams. Them, them, worse than Tony. Worse than Tony. I, <laughs> these are great people, obviously. I just love to work. And if you come to my show, and that's from Tom Jones to Jerry Seinfeld to Chris Rock to anybody coming to my show, uh, Aretha Franklin, when she was alive, if you come to my show, you're working. It was Vegas like it used to be. You think uh, 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 you think I'm gonna do the work and I got people out there, other professionals, uh, uh, Alonzo Bowden, all the comedians, yeah. you're welcome. Come in as Vegas like it used to be and let's have some fun. I I'm coming it. to your show. I'm yeah. coming, George, because I've always wanted to play Vegas. And you can you can come to my show and you can do as much time as you like. And people I'm be coming. people be mad. I'm like, hey, that's the show tonight. You never know what you're gonna see when you get to see come oh, to see I'm George coming, Wallace. I'm Wayne, yeah. Wayne, what, what what were you doing before you got your big break? What were your humble beginners before comedy took off or before Broadway took off? Wayne got a break? I mean, what what happened to Wayne? What did he do? He got a break, what did he do? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was on the grind, man. I was doing, uh, uh, I did everything from theme parks. Um, I started off, I, I was a character at Disney. I was Tigger and Goofy, which made me very happy because, you know, it's the South. So a lot of, you know, folks folks that didn't necessarily like people that looked like us would come to the park with their kids. And it would make me very happy because when they're saying, hey, Tigger, Tigger, hug my wife. If they only knew the <laughs> Tigger was a, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So Are you, sure, was, you sure they were saying Tigger? Well, they probably you saw you in a house full of they, saw, they probably saw you in a house full of hunkies, and so they thought Tigger was okay too. <laughs> oh my but, god! That's Wayne crazy. was in Las Vegas one time. Wayne, weren't you in Las Vegas when I was there? Also, he had a uh, residency yeah. in Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, I had, had a residency at the um, at the uh, oh my god, I'm at the Palazzo. Palazzo, yeah, Venetian Palazzo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Venetian. Um, I was there for about two years. Yes, and nice. and and I got a chance to see see you a couple times. And man, you are mastery. You downplay what you do in the sense of it is like old school Vegas. It's it's the kind of Vegas that I dream of because I'm a big Rat Pack fan and Sammy yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the kind of show that you have. You never know who is going to be there. You never know what the night's going to be like, but it's always going to be amazing. So thank, thank you so much, brother. You, you, know, so much. Did, you know, I didn't ask me what I did before. I, didn't I, do anything. I, I was coming. I was coming to you, Gene. I was coming to you. We, we just had to let the people who I believe they pay grades, so I don't stop them talking. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to get canceled. I think, I, I think I've got the strangest job. Uh, I used to build and repair elevators. Before I did comedy. Hold on a second. You used to go up and, and down. Yep. You used to go up an, and down. I was an engineer for Otis. 
I worked for Otis building elevators. I, I yes. always wanted to meet Mr. Otis you because Mr. Otis had a heart attack because he made an elevator because he wouldn't walk his ass up and down those steps. I always wanted to meet Mr. Otis. <laughs> you win. Yeah, that's, that's what great. I did. That's what I did. Wow. I, was, I was an engineer. That's what I did. I was the it first. Sounds like a pretty, pretty I was dangerous the first, job. Yeah, I worked for Otis in the UK and I was their first female engineer in oh my their goodness. history. Amazing. That's but was amazing. that a dangerous? If, was that a somewhat? It was extremely a dangerous job. Oh okay. yeah, I, I nearly died on several occasions. Uh, nearly got oh. decapi nearly got decapitated. Nearly fell down. Shot. I, I knew a couple of guys that died on the job. It was a very because when you're repairing the elevator, you ride on top of them. I here's a little bit of history. I rode on top of the elevators at the World Trade Center. Obviously pre. -90s. You did what? Yeah, I used to work for Otis, as I said, and right. I knew a lot of American engineers. Uh, because our Canary Wharf, which is the, was at the time the tallest building in Europe, was an exact replica of the two smaller towers of the World Trade Center. We didn't know how to build skyscrapers. Oh, okay. So they brought American engineers to England to show us how to build okay. the elevator wow. as a skyscraper. And I kept it. I was a baby. I was 21 wow. years old. So they all took me under their wing. And uh, so when I came to New York to visit, they took me to the World Trade Center and we sneaked and I rode on top, not in the elevator, on top of the elevators. How old were Trade you Center. in your mind just for the first get up and just walked away from you? You rode on the top of an elevator in the Twin Towers? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's all we need to know. We know what's wrong with you now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, no. a dead devil. I'm a dead devil. Hold We got to go to break. We'll be right back. Back with Gina, Wayne, and George. It's your boy, the Destin Legend, Leon Rogers. We're having a great mm -hmm. show today, laughing, kicking it. Uh, George. Yes, sir. First of all, I didn't tell you. First of all, let me finish. I didn't answer your question, what I did before Comedian. Okay. I was vice president of the world's largest outdoor advertising agency. Everything at Times Square, the spectaculars, the billboards, everything in Chicago, the uh, 5,000 buses in New York City, the 10 top markets in America. I was vice president of ads and uh, I made a lot of money back in uh, back in the 70s. So I was making money to get a, a foundation or a cushion uh, for comedy, but I always wanted to be a comedian, but I sold those spaces at Times Square. When you go there, you see the lights splashing right. spectacles. I did that and uh, I enjoyed mm. that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hey, all right, so you know, so they was I was grabbing bags before y'all got here. I think me and Wayne was the only one that had to dress up like animals and work <laughs> out for him. <laughs> didn't work out for me. I was at this place. Uh, I was at this terrible place called uh, Jeepers, and I was a, a purple rhinoceros. And I knew my life hit rock bottom when my 19 year old manager. I'm 28 at the time, mind you. When my my 19 year old manager said, "Go over there and clean that vomit up in the barrel," and I was oh, like, yeah, I, got to, oh. "I got to go." Oh. This comedy oh. has to work. Comedy has to work. It's over. You know, let's talk about some of the struggles you had during your career because this is a male dominated industry and a lot of, and a lot you know women don't get yes. the respect that they deserve what are some of the struggles you've had to deal with coming up and, and 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 i don't know is it different in the uk you know or is it pretty much the same all around it's pretty much the same um in the uk it was a struggle coming up uh there were not many women uh black women i was trying to you know be as broad as possible and perform to any audience i could and it's very segregated as it is in america you had the the black circuit the white circuit uh, white industry executives never came to the black shows to pick talent. So television was very white. And as a black comic, I mean, I made my own way. I started, you know, I've always been making, making my, I made my own specials. I was like, you're not gonna give me a special? I'm gonna shoot my own special. So I'd rent a theater and rent a film crew and make my own specials. And, then, and, and I just always hustled to make my own thing. But in England, yeah, I hit a glass ceiling. As a black, I, I used to do a joke uh, that where I said that they, uh, the industry in the UK is like a nightclub policy when it comes to black comics, one in, one out. One, yes. black, one black comic got on TV Real. and the rest of us would sit back and wait till they die exactly. or messed up to get on because we couldn't get on. And, uh, you know, I became very well known very quickly in England and I, I hit that glass ceiling where my white counterparts, my, my white male counterparts would be opening for me one week and then a year later they are multi-millionaires exactly. selling out stadiums and i'm here so i was like i've always dreamed to live in america since i was a kid so i was like you know what i'm gonna go to the states because at least 
the racism in America is in your face, you know where you stand with it. And if you hit the glass ceiling in America, the ceiling's a lot higher. So at least you're a millionaire when you're here and you can cry in your money. So I'm going to go to America. And, I, you know, I had very similar issues when I came here. Like I, I was like, well, I'm very well known in England. I'm a good comedian. I'll come out here. I'll make, I'll do, make my living doing comedy until I can get on a TV show. And it was very hard getting on, into clubs because for one, women, two, black women. So I'd go into clubs and I'd go into the market and they'd only try and market me to a particular audience. Oh, you're urban. They'd look at this and go, all right, she's going to talk about her vagina for an hour. She's going to... So they make judgments based on what I look like as to what my comedy is going to be. And I say to these people, can you just market me to anybody who likes comedy? Don't just market me to this one market. Mark and, you know, as a woman, it was, it was a struggle going to these clubs and trying to get seen because they don't really... Women, women, especially black women, we're not getting books at these clubs unless we're famous, unless we are super famous. These white guys, mediocre white guys can get on and be given a chance. They'll That's true. Pay, they'll paper the room and help you get on. But with us, it, it just was never like that. So this was my struggle in America. So how I used to get on at clubs was just sit in the back of comedy clubs. And when somebody was late, they go, oh, so-and-so's okay. running late. I go, well, I'm here. I can go on and do five minutes if you want until this person gets it. And that's how I used to get booked. In fact, that's how I got Deaf Comedy Jam. I just happened to be sitting in the back of the room <laughs> while they were doing a showcase. And Damon Wayans Jr. went on and ripped that show apart. And none of the other comics wanted to follow him because they were showcasing. They didn't want to look bad. And I was just sitting at the back of the room. And I was like, I don't care. I'll go on and do five minutes. Good. And I went on and did five minutes. And that's how I got Deaf Comedy Jam. So, yeah, it's just been a constant hustle fighting against preconceived notions of what a woman comedian is and what a black woman comedian is and then furthermore me coming to america as a british woman they were like well you know this is before idris elba and before all these other black british comics were uh, actors were out here so i was out here on my own and people would be looking at me like what 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 is that what is the, i don't my mouth and they go you an australian aborigine what is going on oh. Oh, yeah, it was, it was hard. It was hard. Damn. Was hard. Are that, you that, one of the first black comedians to come over? Let's who are over? Who else came over from England? Black. Let, I don't Lenny know. Henry came Mella over Henry, and yes. did a, sh a film. Uh, On Broadway. He, yeah. did, he did a film where he was, he, they made him a white guy or something. I can't. Yeah. That it, killed it, him. It, That's it great. Did, yeah, yeah, he did do great. well and he, he went back. But I was, the, I came in doing nothing. I came in with no, none of that behind me. I had to start from the bottom and work my way up. Gina, that story that you tell about the Def Jam audition, which is, is in my proper, book, by the way, it's in my, my book. It's a proper story that all young comics should take note of to seize the day, seize yeah. the moment, and that's what yeah. you did. You weren't scared, you seize the moment. Wayne, let's go to you. Far struggles. Uh, I want to kind of change it up for you though, because you've always been a well-rounded individual. Everything, and I always admired. Admired that because growing up, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, but I listened to Duran Duran and I used to catch black chat. But at the same time, that was just like what I like. I listen to rap too, but I listen to everything. Was that a struggle for you sometimes with the African American audience, them kind of looking at you different because you're so well rounded, just not doing good? I mean, you can talk it, but at the end of the day, you're okay. That, that has been a struggle. Um, and I and I think, you know, it's a much larger conversation in the sense of it, it leans back into what we are told as black people, what, what is black and what being, being black means. And it's supposed mm -hmm. to be a monolithic thing. I always tell people, we as black people, I think of us as, as it's like with your family, right? Yes. If, if somebody comes over to my house, I'm not gonna disrespect you or call you out of your name when we're talking in front of that person because I don't want them to use what I say to you and I turn do. around and go, well, Wayne called this dude or such and such, so I'm gonna call him that. I'm gonna talk to you in private. I feel that we have taught certain members of, of the entertainment field, of well, hell, just of the country, we've given them permission to say certain things to us and to treat us a certain way because we treat each other a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that just leads me back to that conversation about, about uh, about how our audiences look at you. When I came out on Whose Line, I was the only black dude doing improv right. comedy, which we hadn't really seen in the mainstream on, on US TV. I grew up on the British version, but so, so, so many of my tastes were already British comedy and I know so much about it. And, and, so, that, and so that was my deal. So I was looked at funny because I was doing this thing. 
Nobody cared to ask where I came from. They, they didn't want to know which hood that I was from because they, they just assumed that because I can make a white audience laugh. Well, I pride mm -hmm. myself on I can make a white audience laugh, a pink audience laugh, exactly. a black audience laugh. Come That's on. how you make the money. If, if That's you how you make pulse, the money. You're funny That's to how everybody. You make the money. If you got a pulse, I'm going to make you laugh. Come mm -hmm. on. But there's a Come lot on. that we need to work through culturally so we can accept ourselves and we can accept difference in ourselves because we were taught a long time ago what black was back when we were slaves. And that is inaccurate information. George, when we come back, we're going to let you piggyback off his statement because you was there when where they were being taught that stuff. So I want you to speak on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. We'll be right back. I don't, later with I don't have come to take this. Before the guest and legend Leon Rogers, I'm here later with Leon. And, and before we left from the break, we were talking about struggles in the comedy game. And now I want to go to George. What struggles did you go through coming up in this comedy game? And did it ever change your perception about comedy? This is still something that you always wanted to do. I don't know how to explain this about struggle, but I walked into the comic strip in New York City. I was selling advertising on the buses for the comic strip. Put your business in the street. And I said to them, by the way, I do a little act also. And they said, come in tomorrow night. I went in Thursday night and I've been on stage ever since. So I'm, I don't know how to say I never struggle, but I've been working all my life. I did the Tonight Show on Thursday. Friday night, I was in front of 17,000 people opening for Natalie Cole. All I ever wanted to do was be a comedian. Wow. I worked for Natalie Cole, I worked for Tom Jones for five years, Diana Ross, Donna Summer, everybody. just in the circle, in the round, any theater I can work. Also doing television, what Wayne was talking about. I never cared about color. I just wanted to work. And uh, when you do the Tonight, Tonight Show and all of those talk shows, you, I got a white, I got, my audience is mixed. 60 40. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't give a damn what it's going to be. I just want to do jokes and I just want you to laugh. And when I see happy people, it makes me happier. So I'm the three of us, I think we have mixed audiences and that's yeah. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've always, I've always wanted to make everybody laugh, but coming to America, you see how black comedy is perceived, how it's supposed to be. So everybody has had that assumption that every black comic had to be like the comic. Right. Black comedy. Like I did a show called Shaq's All Stars in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I, I went on stage, I did my set and, you know, I got away with it, but the audience were looking at me like, this bitch ain't talked about a pussy. Shane said, motherfucker once, what the, what is this bullshit? That's how cause Shaq was sitting in the front row looking at me like, what what is this? She's just she's just talking funny, but there's a weird accent, but there's no cussing. <laughs> there's no cussing. Shane took my my pussy's so I didn't do any, I don't do that. You know we're not on a break, right? <laughs> I know, I know. It's true. But hey. anyway, put it this way, I'm gonna re-edit myself. Right. I did, I did right, Shaq's Wayne. And and uh -huh. George and Gina, it was a good run. Thank you. I, Sorry, I, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit it so you can. But basically, <laughs> basically, the audience was looking at me because I wasn't doing the type of comedy that they were told exactly. to yeah. expect, which is a lot of cussing, a lot of sex stuff, a lot, yeah. and, and that's not what I do. My stuff is broad. I I do cuss. I do do certain stuff, but I'm I'm my subject matter is broader. And yes. uh, that, that's not what they expected. So it, yeah, it was a struggle. Now it got to a point where I was like, I don't care. I'm just going to do what I do. And you guys will come to me eventually when you realize I'm funny without having to do a specific type of comedy. There's room for all types of comedy. Exactly. Within that comedy scene. But you know what? That's, that's where the weird circle comes from. Because what happens is because black comedy is supposed to be something. If you don't fit that, that mold, and then you walk into, even when you're auditioning for a movie or a TV show, if you walk into a room that is not a black room, but then the guy behind that desk is like, okay, so the character's name is Cleon and you're gonna do right. such and such. And then I do my take on he's like, oh, that's mm. not black. That's and well, how can you tell me what you think is black? Because there has been a thing that, well, this is black and that's what it is that's what and that's know. all it is. And if we all buy into that, then that's the problem because we have so many beautiful colors and shades and and types that it's a shame to narrow it down to just this one thing. Yeah, now, I, when we when we made my TV show, I always sat in the casting room. So when those black actors came in, they mm. saw me. Right. And then they knew that they were not going to be asked to do any kind of buffoonery. Right. Because they knew there was a black person in the casting room making sure that this this was properly done. 
you know? But this, That's what we, this need, is, we need more. This is, what's so, this is what's so funny to me about that whole thing right there. Because I've watched plenty of comics who I thought were squeaky clean guys on the white side. And some of the dirtiest, like, you know, I Bob watched Saget. Bob Saget show. Bob yeah. Saget, Bob Saget, yeah. yeah. And then you go back, Lenny Bruce. Like, this, this is not new to their side either, but why don't they get looked? Why is that not their type of comedy? Because I've heard, I mean, I've heard, I mean, Sam Kennison, like, of course, Dice Clay. Like, we, I could go on for days of comics that get it in, you know what I'm saying? So I just never understood that uh, about black comics only do this, only do that. Did, did certain shows make this for us? Like, did, did, did Def Jam, for as much as it helped black comedians, did it kind of put us in a certain light as well? Because the stereotype is if you're black and you're male, then you're loud and you're aggressive and you're thug and this is what it is. If you're a black woman, then you get the word sassy attached to you. Well, she's right. a sassy this, sassy that. So any material that backs that up, which is fine because that is a part of us, but it's not the totality, but that's the bit that, that is chosen. It's like, we are all judged by this measuring stick. Whereas a Bob Saget, a Sam Kinison, any of the guys that are out, out working right now, um, what's her name? Amy, um, Amy Schumer. 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 Amy Schumer, filthy, filthy act, but she is perceived as main, mainstream. So that being said, we don't get the same tolerance across the board. So it's a very interesting conversation. It's a conversation that I think is open now because of the time that we're in. You know, looking into history, our greatest teachers, greatest, we had Richard Pryor, we had Eddie Murphy, we had Red Fox. And so that was almost like a, a guide for uh, young black comedians coming up to do anything they want to do. And I'm glad you can express yourself in any way you want to express yourself. But that's what they thought black comedians should be like, Richard Pryor, they should be like. Uh, and the blacks didn't want to be like Bill Cosby. Uh, uh, I did, I wanted to be like any, I just wanted to be funny. But some of our greatest comedians were uh, dirty, so. And it but doesn't I, I mean, matter. I mean, I mean, dirty but brilliant though. They yeah. were smart, like th there are cats who, and anybody can curse, but right. Eddie Murphy is a master of storytelling. Fantastic. Richard Pryor, a master, master. of storytelling. So they so didn't see that. Didn't they don't see that. They see right. the MFs. They see the MFs as they see the all the cursing right. and all of the, the, the Yeah, white comics are allowed to run the gamut from whimsical airy fairy comedy right up to the filth and they they're enjoy they're able to enjoy that and encompass whatever aspect whatever facet of their comedy that they want to do whereas black comics we tend to be pushed into a box you're either this or you're nerd so now there's been the def jam type comedy and now there's now this resurgence of black nerd kind of comedy and it, it wasn't cool before but now it's become a thing and so you just have to try and fit into one of those boxes and you're like well can i just be Myself. I should. You should just be you. That's what yeah, I try to do. Yeah, I'm just going to do what I do. Yeah, I, yeah. I do what I do. And there's a market for everybody. No matter what you do, somebody's going to like you. I knew when Sam Kennison first started, he was crazy. People were walking out on him. Well, of course, people were walking out on Paul, Paul Mooney. But uh, eventually, they got a following. But, and if you can put asses in the seats, that's the name of the game. Yeah. But here's the thing. I think, and, and before we go to break, I want to say this. I think they choose not to look at who are we are as a broad spectrum. Yes, we had Richard Pryor. Yes, we had Red Fox. But we also had Pygmy Markham. If you yeah. go back to some of their sketches, man. And we also had uh, Dick Gregory, who was one of my favorites of all time, the OG yes. teaching while he was talking. I just think they choose to overlook those people. Bill Cosby, Sinbad, all people that didn't have Sinbad. a lot of... And they act and was because it doesn't fit into what they want to believe black people are. It yeah. doesn't fit that box. And because you don't fit that box, they kind of discard you. But now they're being forced with the internet and the people making their own content. They're being forced to reckon with those pre And it was ideas. still I, their game. It was still their game. And it is today their game. And sometimes you have to play by the rules to break the rules. We'll be right Amen. back later with Leon coming up. I'm you sorry. know, I'm sometimes... Sorry. Sometimes you forget who you do things with, and they I'm show sorry. you the true colors. I'm on the day, man. Gina Yasha Ray, Wayne Brady, and George Wallace. I wish we could tell y'all some of the stuff that goes on during the commercial. Uh -huh. <laughs> nothing happened. Nothing happened. I just nothing said, happened. you know, I, 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 I said I could have been your real daddy. That's all I said. So look, <laughs> I, I, I write us here, man. My man, uh, my man Jay Davis, man, and the crew. 
we got this thing that we got called This Is Racist. Take a look. I need to get my nails done before I go anywhere, girl. Hold on for a second. Excuse me. Are you almost done with your break? Because I need a full set done ASAP. I'm sorry, miss. You've been mistaken. Yeah, 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 the... yeah. Whatever, kimchi. Can you do my nails or what? This is racist. And what should our contestant, May Lang, do? Should she A, kick Tamika's ass for assuming that she's a male tech? B, politely explain to Tamika that she does not work there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't work at this place. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, whatever, kimchi. Maybe you, I can go get someone for you. Is that, uh, how about that? I, I, you, I know the owner. Of you it. do nails. <laughs> Or C, take Tamika's life in broad daylight. Just right this way. I'll be in in just a second. And let's see what today's contestant decides to do. So are you almost done with your break? Yes, I am. Would you like a pedicure with that? Yes, please. All oh, right, this way then. Oh, it's cash only. We don't take link. Until next time, this is... A and C, A and C, and kick, she did the right thing. Kick her ass right there on the spot. She, that was racist, and the, the Asian lady did the right thing. Definitely sure. it was more racist to just assume that 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 the Asian actress could do a perfectly executed roundhouse kick. Roundhouse kick. Exactly, just the assumption, the assumption that she can do kung fu is racist <laughs> because it was really karate. Right. <laughs> it has happened before. I ate at a restaurant in Los Angeles called 72 Market Street. I was walking up with my friend Jerry Seinfeld. I happen to have on a red jacket. White guy pulls up in a Jaguar, gets out, gives me the keys. He goes in the restaurant. I get my car. They went to get my car. Uh, ballet went to get my car. I got in my car with his keys and drove off. He assumed. <laughs> yes. Joy. Well, before we get out of here, man, what you got going on? What you got coming up, big bro? Hey, man, I just wrote a book, too. I'm, I'm very jealous. I wrote a book called Bull How many Twitch. pages? Four? <laughs> That's a pamphlet. You know, you oh. know, you, you know, you're doing the wrong thing, right? Don't you don't you start this book? It's called Bull Twit and Whatnot. And it's a funny yeah. story about me growing up, some of the things I would do because I don't play by the rules. You know, like I'll eat cupcakes out of a pan and pancakes out of a cup. I do think it because I don't care. Okay. I don't I'll drink a half a glass of whole milk and a whole glass of half and a half. I don't care. I don't play by the rules. Some lady shouted out in the audience one night, Mr. Wallace. If you drink a half a glass of whole milk and a whole glass of half and a half, you may not give a crap, but you're going to take one. So it's a little clips like that, how poor I was growing up in Atlanta. Uh, the book just gives you online ramblings of George Wallace. We grew up so poor watching television. We never knew uh, uh, we, we could only watch Sanford. We never knew there was a son. Some stuff like that, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, things like that. So you need to go. You follow me. I, I forget to do this all the time. Follow me. At Mr. George Wallace, okay, in the Twitter world. I was voted top 25 funniest tweeters in the world by Rolling Stone magazine. So y'all need funny, you need funny, okay? <laughs> Dana, we know you got we know you got the book release coming out. What else you got going on besides the show on CBS? Uh I, I, uh, I, <laughs> it's cooking. Many things. Um uh obviously the book's coming out tomorrow. I've got uh, the show is we just got picked up for season three of Bob Hart Savage Show, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, I do lots of voiceover stuff. So I do a show called The Barbarian and the Troll. Okay. Which is on, axe, which is on Nickelodeon on Friday nights. Yeah. And I play The Axe. axe. Yep. That. So yeah, I'm busy. Uh, follow me at Gina Yashere. I'm easy. I don't. At Gina, G I N A Y A S H E R E, or my name.com. Or just put into Google, what's that Nigerian British comic? I will come up first. Uh, please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, all of that. And uh, I'm buying my book. Let me squeeze in one more thing, okay, before we get out of here, then we ain't got all the other time. Okay, I'm doing a show with Norman Lear, the great Norman Lear, me, okay? It's called yes. Clean Slate, me and Laverne Cox, okay? It's oh, a version wow. of <laughs> Sanford and Son. It's a version of Sanford and Son, but my son goes away for 31 years in New York City, knocks on the door. She has transgendered, and he's, she's just dead. It's me, me who? Are you his wife? I, I was very nice. So we're going to educate America on be who you are and love who you are. Yes. And, we, and we're taking her to the black church and people are going to go, I don't know Henry had a daughter. Well, hell, I didn't know either. But we're going to make people. <laughs> but with Laverne Cox and Norman Lear, it's going to be a great show, Clean Slate. So look for that. Amazing. 
So that we're working on that. Dang. Man, I can't wait to watch Clean Slay. I yeah. love that. Thank um, you. Let's see. I've got the, uh, we we have season 13, geez, of uh, 13. Because you know what? That is a blessing, man. In a business where you are lucky to even get a pilot, to even get on a studio lot, I have been uh, been been the host of a uh, big ass show for yes. uh, going on 13 years. It is a blessing. And we've turned it into this great daytime sketch and improv show and I get to give people money and change lives. That's I'm, a blessing. I'm waiting for a cool um, way. I'm waiting for cool so I can come on and I'm waiting for the cool. Can you can come any day you want to. I'm, I'm waiting, waiting for the call from you, Gina. Yeah, <laughs> real quick. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> rap is gonna wrap up a show. Gene Gene is gonna to executive to executive to produce and write a show that I'm gonna star in. I don't know the name of it yet. But what? but we gonna do it. Let's do it. I know you. I know I'm gonna be your daddy. I know hey. that. Hey, hey, listen. <laughs> we gotta we gotta get out of here, man. I appreciate you all for stopping by. This is my last show of the season. We'll be back in the fall. Gina, we'll uh, Wayne, George, you have all made me valid. Thank you. I can talk crazy. And I still don't like you. And I still don't like you. If you see something in these streets, say something.